Section 10 of A Little Tour in France by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 24. At Narbonne I took up my abode at the house of a serrurier mechanicien, and was very thankful for the accommodation. It was my misfortune to arrive in this ancient city late at night, on the eve of market day, and market day at Narbonne is a very serious affair. The inns on this occasion are stuffed with wine dealers, for the country round about, dedicated almost exclusively to Bacchus, has hitherto escaped the phylloxera. This deadly enemy of the grape is encamped over the Midi in a hundred places, blighted vineyards and ruined proprietors being quite the order of the day. The signs of distress are more frequent as you advance into Provence, many of the vines being laid under water in the hope of washing the plague away. There are healthy regions still, however, and the vintners find plenty to do at Narbonne. The traffic in wine appeared to be the sole thought of the Narbonnais. Everyone I spoke to had something to say about the harvest of gold that bloomed under its influence. C'est inouï, monsieur, l'argent qu'il y a dans ce pays. Des gens à qui la vente de leur vin rapporte jusqu'à cinq cent mille francs par an. That little speech, addressed to me by a gentleman at the inn, gives the note of these revelations. It must be said that there was little in the appearance either of the town or of its population to suggest the possession of such treasures. Narbonne is a sale petite ville in all the force of the term, and my first impression on arriving there was an extreme regret that I had not remained for the night at lovely Carcassonne. My journey from that delectable spot lasted a couple of hours, and was performed in darkness, a darkness not so dense, however, but that I was able to make out, as we passed it, the great figure of Bézier, whose ancient roofs and towers, clustered on a goodly hilltop, looked as fantastic as you please. I know not what appearance Bézier may present by day, but by night it has quite the grand air. On issuing from the station at Narbonne, I found that the only vehicle in waiting was a kind of bastard tram-car, a thing shaped as if it had been meant to go upon rails, that is, equipped with small wheels placed beneath it, and with a platform at either end, but destined to rattle over the stones like the most vulgar of omnibuses. To complete the oddity of this conveyance, it was under the supervision not of a conductor, but of a conductress. A fair young woman, with a pouch suspended from her girdle, had command of the platform, and as soon as the car was full she jolted us into the town through clouds of the thickest dust I have ever swallowed. I have had occasion to speak of the activity of women in France, of the way they are always in the ascendant, and here was a signal example of their general utility. The young lady I have mentioned conveyed her whole company to the wretched little Hôtel de France, where it is to be hoped that some of them found a lodging. For myself, I was informed that the place was crowded from cellar to attic, and that its inmates were sleeping three or four in a room. At Carcassonne I should have had a bad bed, but at Narbonne, apparently, I was to have no bed at all. I passed an hour or two of flat suspense, while fate settled the question of whether I should go on to Perpignan, return to Béziers, or still discover a modest couch at Narbonne. I shall not have suffered in vain, however, if my example serves to deter other travellers from alighting unannounced at that city on a Wednesday evening. The retreat to Béziers, not attempted in time, proved impossible and I was assured that at Perpignan, which I should not reach till midnight, the affluence of wine-dealers was not less than at Narbonne. I interviewed every hostess in the town, and got no satisfaction but distracted shrugs. Finally, at an advanced hour, one of the servants of the Hôtel de France, where I had attempted to dine, came to me in triumph to proclaim that he had secured for me a charming apartment in a maison bourgeoise. I took possession of it gratefully, in spite of its having an entrance like a stable, and being pervaded by an odour compared with which that of a stable would have been delicious. As I have mentioned, my landlord was a locksmith, and he had strange machines which rumbled and whirred in the rooms below my own. 
Nevertheless, I slept, and I dreamed of Carcassonne. It was better to do that than to dream of the Hôtel de France. I was obliged to cultivate relations with the cuisine of this establishment. Nothing could have been more meridional. Indeed, both the dirty little inn and Narbonne at large seemed to me to have the infirmities of the South without its usual graces. Narrow, noisy, shabby, belittered and encumbered, filled with clatter and chatter, the Hôtel de France would have been described in perfection by Alphonse Daudet. For what struck me above all in it was the note of the Midi, as he has represented it, the sound of universal talk. The landlord sat at supper with sundry friends in a kind of glass cage, with a genial indifference to arriving guests. The waiters tumbled over the loose luggage in the hall, the travellers who had been turned away leaned gloomily against doorposts, and the landlady, surrounded by confusion, unconscious of responsibility, and animated only by the spirit of conversation, bandied high-voiced compliments with the voyageurs de commerce. At ten o'clock in the morning there was a table d'hôte for breakfast, a wonderful repast which overflowed into every room and pervaded the whole establishment. I sat down with a hundred hungry marketers, fat, brown, greasy men, with a good deal of the rich soil of Languedoc adhering to their hands and their boots. I mentioned the latter articles because they almost put them on the table. It was very hot, and there were swarms of flies. The viands had the strongest odour. There was in particular a horrible mixture known as gras double, a light, grey, glutinous, nauseating mess, which my companions devoured in large quantities. A man opposite to me had the dirtiest fingers I ever saw, a collection of fingers which in England would have excluded him from a farm as ordinary. The conversation was mainly bucolic, though a part of it, I remember, at the table at which I sat, consisted of a discussion as to whether or no the maid-servant were sage, a discussion which went on under the nose of this young lady as she carried about the dreadful gras double, and to which she contributed the most convincing blushes. It was thoroughly meridional. In going to Narbonne, I had, of course, counted upon Roman remains, but when I went forth in search of them, I perceived that I had hoped too fondly. There is really nothing in the place to speak of. That is, on the day of my visit there, there was nothing but the market, which was in complete possession. This intricate, curious, but lifeless town, Murray calls it, yet to me it appeared overflowing with life. Its streets are mere crooked, dirty lanes, bordered with perfectly insignificant houses, but they were filled with the same clatter and chatter that I had found at the hotel. The market was held partly in the little square of the Hôtel de Ville, a structure which a flattering woodcut in the Guy Joanne had given me a desire to behold. The reality was not impressive, the old colour of the front having been completely restored away. Such interest as it superficially possesses, it derives from a fine medieval tower which rises beside it, with turrets at the angles, always a picturesque thing. The rest of the market was held in another place, still shabbier than the first, which lies beyond the canal. The Canal du Midi flows through the town, and spanned at this point by a small suspension bridge, presented a certain sketchability. On the further side were the vendors and chafferers, old women under awnings and big umbrellas, rickety tables piled high with fruit, white caps and brown faces, blouses, sabots, donkeys. Beneath this picture was another, a long row of washerwomen on their knees, on the edge of the canal, pounding and wringing the dirty linen of Narbonne, no great quantity to judge by the costume of the people. Innumerable rusty men, scattered all over the place, were buying and selling wine, straddling about in pairs, in groups, with their hands in their pockets, and packed together at the doors of the cafés. They were mostly fat and brown and unshaven. They ground their teeth as they talked. They were very meridionaux. The only two lions at Narbonne are the cathedral and the museum, the latter of which is quartered in the Hôtel de Ville. The cathedral, closely shut in by houses, and with the west front undergoing repairs, is singular in two respects. It consists exclusively of a choir, 
which is of the end of the thirteenth century and the beginning of the next, and of great magnificence. There is absolutely nothing else. This choir, of extraordinary elevation, forms the whole church. I sat there a good while. There was no other visitor. I had taken a great dislike to poor little Narbonne, which struck me as sordid and overheated, and this place seemed to extend to me, as in the Middle Ages, the privilege of sanctuary. It is a very solemn corner. The other peculiarity of the cathedral is that externally it bristles with battlements, having anciently formed part of the defences of the Archeviché, which is beside it and which connects it with the Hôtel de Ville. This combination of the church and the fortress is very curious, and during the Middle Ages was not without its value. The palace of the former archbishops of Narbonne, the Hôtel de Ville of today forms part of it, was both an asylum and an arsenal during the hideous wars by which the Languedoc was ravaged in the thirteenth century. The whole mass of buildings is jammed together in a manner that from certain points of view makes it far from apparent which feature is which. The museum occupies several chambers at the top of the Hôtel de Ville, and it is not an imposing collection. It was closed, but I induced the portress to let me in, a silent, cadaverous person in a black coif like a beguine, who sat knitting in one of the windows while I went the rounds. The number of Roman fragments is small, and their quality is not the finest. I must add that this impression was hastily gathered. There is indeed a work of art in one of the rooms which creates a presumption in favour of the place, the portrait, rather a good one, of a citizen of Narbonne, whose name I forget, who is described as having devoted all his time and his intelligence to collecting the objects by which the visitor is surrounded. This excellent man was a connoisseur, and the visitor is doubtless often an ignoramus. Chapter 25 Set with its glistening houses white, curves with the curving beach away, to where the lighthouse beacons bright, far in the bay. That stanza of Matthew Arnold's, which I happen to remember, gave a certain importance to the half-hour I spent in the buffet of the station at set while I waited for the train to Montpellier. I had left Narbonne in the afternoon, and by the time I reached set, the darkness had descended. I therefore missed the sight of the glistening houses, and had to console myself with that of the beacon in the bay, as well as with the bouillon of which I partook at the buffet aforesaid, for since the morning I had not ventured to return to the table d'hôte at Narbonne. The Hôtel Neuve of Montpellier, which I reached an hour later, has an ancient renown all over the south of France, advertises itself, I believe, as le plus vaste du midi. It seemed to me the model of a good provincial inn, a big, rambling, creaking establishment with brown labyrinthine corridors, a queer old open-air vestibule into which the diligence in the bon temps used to penetrate, and a hospitality more expressive than that of the new caravansaries. It dates from the days when Montpellier was still accounted a fine winter residence for people with weak lungs, and this rather melancholy tradition, together with the former celebrity of the school of medicine still existing there, but from which the glory has departed, helps to account for its combination of high antiquity and vast proportions. The old hotels were usually more concentrated, but the school of medicine passed for one of the attractions of Montpellier. Long before Mentone was discovered or Colorado invented, British invalids travelled down through France in the post-chaise or in the public coach to spend their winters in the wonderful place which boasted both a climate and a faculty. The air is mild, no doubt, but there were refinements of mildness which were not then suspected, and which in a more analytic age have carried the annual wave far beyond Montpellier. The place is charming all the same, and it served the purpose of John Locke, who made a long stay there between 1675 and 1679 and became acquainted with the noble fellow visitor, Lord Pembroke, to whom he dedicated the famous essay. There are places that please without your being able to say wherefore, and Montpellier is one of the number. It has some charming views from the great promenade of the Peyrou, but its position is not strikingly fair. 
Beyond this it contains a good museum and the long facades of its school, but these are its only definite treasures. Its cathedral struck me as quite the weakest I had seen, and I remember no other monument that made up for it. The place has neither the gaiety of a modern nor the solemnity of an ancient town, and it is agreeable, as certain women are agreeable, who are neither beautiful nor clever. An Italian would remark that it is sympathetic, a German would admit that it is gemütlich, I spent two days there mostly in the rain, and even under these circumstances I carried away a kindly impression. I think the Hôtel Neuve has something to do with it, and the sentiment of relief with which, in a quiet, even a luxurious room that looked out on a garden, I reflected that I had washed my hands of Narbonne. The phylloxera has destroyed the vines in the country that surrounds Montpellier, and at that moment I was capable of rejoicing in the thought that I should not breakfast with the vintners. The gem of the place is the Musée Fabre, one of the best collections of paintings in a provincial city. François Fabre, a native of Montpellier, died there in 1837, after having spent a considerable part of his life in Italy, where he had collected a good many valuable pictures and some very poor ones, the latter class including several from his own hand. He was the hero of a remarkable episode, having succeeded no less a person than Vittorio Alfieri in the affections of no less a person than Louise de Stolberg, Countess of Albany, widow of no less a person than Charles Edward Stuart, the second pretender to the British crown. Surely no woman ever was associated sentimentally with three figures more diverse a disqualified sovereign, an Italian dramatist, and a bad French painter. The productions of M. Fabre, who followed in the steps of David, bear the stamp of a cold mediocrity. There is not much to be said even for the portrait of the genial countess. Her life has been written by M. Saint-René Talendier, who depicts her as delightful, which hangs in Florence, in the gallery of the Uffizi, and makes a pendant to a likeness of Alfieri by the same author. Stendhal, in his Memoire d'un Touriste, says that this work of art represents her as a cook who has pretty hands. I am delighted to have an opportunity of quoting Stendhal, whose two volumes of the Memoire d'un Touriste every traveller in France should carry in his portmanteau. I have had this opportunity more than once, for I have met him at Tours, at Nantes, at Bourges, and everywhere he is suggestive. But he has the defect that he is never pictorial, that he never by any chance makes an image, and that his style is perversely colourless for a man so fond of contemplation. His taste is often singularly false. It is the taste of the early years of the present century, the period that produced clocks surmounted with sentimental subjects. Stendhal does not admire these clocks, but he almost does. He admires Domenichino and Guercino, and prizes the Bolognese school of painters because they spoke to the soul. He is a votary of the new classic, is fond of tall, square, regular buildings, and think Nantes, for instance, full of the air noble. It was a pleasure to me to reflect that five and forty years ago he had alighted in that city, at the very inn in which I spent a night, and which looks down on the Place Craslin and the theatre. The hotel that was the best in 1837 appears to be the best today. On the subject of Touraine, Stendhal is extremely refreshing. He finds the scenery meagre and much overrated, and proclaims his opinion with perfect frankness. He does, however, scant justice to the banks of the Loire. His want of appreciation of the picturesque, want of the sketcher's sense, causes him to miss half the charm of a landscape which is nothing if not quiet, as a painter would say, and of which the felicities reveal themselves only to waiting eyes. He even despises the Indre, the river of Madame Sand. The memoirs d'un touriste are written in the character of a commercial traveller, and the author has nothing to say about Chenonceau or Chambord, or indeed about any of the chateaux of that part of France, his system being to talk only of the large towns, where he may be supposed to find a market for his goods. It was his ambition to pass for an ironmonger, but in the large towns he is usually excellent company, 
though as discursive as stern and strangely indifferent for a man of imagination to those superficial things of which the poor pages now before the reader are mainly an attempt to render it is his conviction that alfieri at florence bored the countess of albany terribly and he adds that the famous gallophobe died of jealousy of the little painter from montpellier the countess of albany left her property to fabre and i suppose some of the pieces in the museum of his native town used to hang in the sunny saloons of that fine old palace on the arno which is still pointed out to the stranger in florence as the residence of alfieri the institution has had other benefactors notably a certain m bruyat who has enriched it with an extraordinary number of portraits of himself as these however are by different hands some of them distinguished we may suppose that it was less the model than the artists to whom m bruyat wished to give publicity easily first are two large specimens of david teniers which are incomparable for brilliancy and a glowing perfection of execution i have a weakness for this singular genius who combined the delicate with the grovelling and i have rarely seen richer examples scarcely less valuable is a gerard dow which hangs near them though it must rank lower as having kept less of its freshness this gerard dow did me good for a master is a master whatever he may paint it represents a woman paring carrots while a boy before her exhibits a mousetrap in which he has caught a frightened victim the good wife has spread a cloth on the top of a big barrel which serves as her table and on this brown greasy napkin of which the texture is wonderfully rendered lie the raw vegetables she is preparing for domestic consumption beside the barrel is a large cauldron lined with copper with a rim of brass the way these things are painted brings tears to the eyes but they give the measure of the musée fabre where two specimens of teniers and a gerard dow are the jewels the italian pictures are of small value but there is a work by sir joshua reynolds said to be the only one in france an infant samuel in prayer apparently a repetition of the picture in england which inspired the little plaster image disseminated in protestant lands that we used to admire in our childhood sir joshua somehow was an eminently protestant painter no one can forget that who in the national gallery in london has looked at the picture in which he represents several young ladies as nymphs voluminously draped hanging garlands over a statue a picture suffused indefinably with the anglican spirit and exasperating to a member of one of the latin races it is an odd chance therefore that has led him into that part of france where protestants have been the least bien vu this is the country of the dragonnade of louis the fourteenth and of the pastors of the desert from the garden of the perou at montpellier you may see the hills of the Cévennes, to which they of the religion fled for safety and out of which they were hunted and harried i have only to add in regard to the musée fabre that it contains the portrait of its founder a little pursy fat-faced elderly man whose countenance contains few indications of the power that makes distinguished victims he is however just such a personage as the mind's eye sees walking on the terrace of the perou of an october afternoon in the early years of the century a plump figure in a chocolate-coloured coat and a culotte that exhibits a good leg a culotte provided with a watch fob from which a heavy seal is suspended this perou to come to it at last is a wonderful place especially to be found in a little provincial city france is certainly the country of towns that aim at completeness more than in other lands they contain stately features as a matter of course we should never have ceased to hear about the perou if fortune had placed it at a shrewsbury or a buffalo it is true that the place enjoys a certain celebrity at home which it amply deserves moreover for nothing could be more impressive and monumental it consists of an elevated platform as murray says an immense terrace laid out in the highest part of the town as a garden and commanding in all directions a view which in clear weather must be of the finest 
I strolled there in the intervals of showers, and saw only the nearer beauties, a great pompous arch of triumph in honour of Louis the Fourteenth, which is not, properly speaking, in the garden, but faces it, straddling across the place by which you approach it from the town. An equestrian statue of that monarch set aloft in the middle of the terrace, and a very exalted and complicated fountain which forms a background to the picture. This fountain gushes from a kind of hydraulic temple, or chateau d'eau, to which you ascend by broad flights of steps, and which is fed by a splendid aqueduct, stretched in the most ornamental and unexpected manner across the neighbouring valley. All this work dates from the middle of the last century. The combination of features, the triumphal arch or gate, the wide fair terrace with its beautiful view, the statue of the grand monarch, the big architectural fountain, which would not surprise one at Rome, but does surprise one at Montpellier, and to complete the effect, the extraordinary aqueduct charmingly foreshortened, all this is worthy of a capital of a little court city. The whole place, with its repeated steps, its balustrades, its massive and plentiful stonework, is full of the air of the last century. Sans bien son dix-huitième siècle, None the less so, I am afraid, that as I read in my faithful Murray, after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, the block, the stake, the wheel, had been erected here for the benefit of the desperate Camisard. Chapter 26 It was a pleasure to feel oneself in Provence again, the land where the silver-grey earth is impregnated with the light of the sky. To celebrate the event, as soon as I arrived at Nîmes, I engaged a calèche to convey me to the Pont du Gard. The day was yet young, and it was perfectly fair. It appeared well for a longest drive to take advantage without delay of such security. After I had left the town, I became more intimate with that Provençal charm which I had already enjoyed from the window of the train, and which glowed in the sweet sunshine and the white rocks and lurked in the smoke puffs of the little olives. The olive trees in Provence are half the landscape. They are neither so tall, so stout, nor so richly contorted as I have seen them beyond the Alps. But this mild, colourless bloom seems the very texture of the country. The road from Nîmes, for a distance of fifteen miles, is superb, broad enough for an army, and as white and firm as a dinner table. It stretches away over undulations which suggest a kind of harmony, and in the curves it makes through the wide free country, where there is never a hedge or a wall, and the detail is always exquisite, there is something majestic, almost processional. Some twenty minutes before I reached the little inn that marks the termination of the drive, my vehicle met with an accident which just missed being serious, and which engaged the attention of a gentleman who, followed by his groom and mounted on a strikingly handsome horse, happened to ride up at the moment. This young man, who, with his good looks and charming manner, might have stepped out of a novel of Octave Feuillet, gave me some very intelligent advice in reference to one of my horses that had been injured, and was so good as to accompany me to the inn, with the resources of which he was acquainted, to see that his recommendations were carried out. The result of our interview was that he interviewed me to come and look at a small but ancient chateau in the neighbourhood, which he had the happiness, not the greatest in the world, he intimated, to inhabit, and at which I engaged to present myself after I should have spent an hour at the Pont du Gard. For the moment, when we separated, I gave all my attention to that great structure. You are very near it before you see it. The ravine it spans suddenly opens and exhibits the picture. The scene at this point grows extremely beautiful. The ravine is the valley of the Gardon, which the road from Nîmes has followed for some time, without taking account of it, but which, exactly at the right distance from the aqueduct, deepens and expands, and puts on those characteristics which are best suited to give it effect. The gorge becomes romantic, still, and solitary, and with its white rocks and wild shrubbery hangs over the clear-coloured river in whose slow course there is here and there a deeper pool. 
Over the valley, from side to side, and ever so high in the air, stretched the three tiers of the tremendous bridge. They are unspeakably imposing, and nothing could well be more Roman. The hugeness, the solidity, the unexpectedness, the monumental rectitude of the whole thing leave you nothing to say, at the time, and make you stand gazing. You simply feel that it is noble and perfect, that it has the quality of greatness. A road branching from the highway descends to the level of the river and passes under one of the arches. This road has a wide margin of grass and loose stones, which slopes upward into the bank of the ravine. You may sit there as long as you please, staring up at the light, strong piers. The spot is extremely natural, though two or three stone benches have been erected on it. I remained there an hour, and got a complete impression. The place was perfectly soundless, and for the time at least lonely. The splendid afternoon had begun to fade, and there was a fascination in the object I had come to see. It came to pass that at the same time I discovered in it a certain stupidity, a vague brutality. That element is rarely absent from great Roman work, which is wanting in the nice adaptation of the means to the end. The means are always exaggerated, the end is so much more than attained. The Roman rigidity was apt to overshoot the mark, and I suppose a race which could do nothing small is as defective as a race that can do nothing great. Of this Roman rigidity, the Pont du Gard is an admirable example. It would be a great injustice, however, not to insist upon its beauty. A kind of manly beauty, that of an object constructed not to please but to serve, and impressive simply from the scale on which it carries out this intention. The number of arches in each tier is different. They are smaller and more numerous as they ascend. The preservation of the thing is extraordinary. Nothing has crumbled or collapsed. Every feature remains, and the huge blocks of stone, of a brownish yellow, as if they had been baked by the Provençal sun for eighteen centuries, pile themselves without mortar or cement as evenly as the day they were laid together. All this to carry the water of a couple of springs to a little provincial city. The conduit on the top has retained its shape and traces of the cement with which it was lined. When the vague twilight began to gather, the lonely valley seemed to fill itself with the shadow of the Roman name, as if the mighty empire were still as erect as the supports of the aqueduct and it was open to a solitary tourist, sitting there sentimental, to believe that no people has ever been, or will ever be, as great as that, measured as we measure the greatness of an individual by the push they gave to what they undertook. The Pont du Gard is one of the three or four deepest impressions they have left. It speaks of them in a manner with which they might have been satisfied. I feel as if it were scarcely discreet to indicate the whereabouts of the chateau of the obliging young man I had met on the way from Nîmes. I must content myself with saying that it nestled in an enchanting valley, dans le fond, as they say in France, and that I took my course thither on foot after leaving the Pont du Gard. I find it noted in my journal as an adorable little corner. The principal feature of the place is a couple of very ancient towers, brownish-yellow in hue, and mantled in scarlet Virginia creeper. One of these towers, reputed to be of Saracenic origin, is isolated, and is only the more effective. The other is incorporated in the house, which is delightfully fragmentary and irregular. It had got to be late by this time, and the lowly castel looked crepuscular and mysterious. An old housekeeper was sent for, who showed me the rambling interior and then the young man took me into a dim old drawing-room which had no less than four chimney-pieces all unlighted and gave me a refection of fruit and sweet wine when i praised the wine and asked him what it was he said simply c'est du vin de ma mère throughout my little journey i had never yet felt myself so far from paris and this was a sensation i enjoyed more than my host who was an involuntary exile, consoling himself with laying out a manege, which he showed me as I walked away. 
His civility was great, and I was greatly touched by it. On my way back to the little inn where I had left my vehicle, I passed the Pont du Gard and took another look at it. Its great arches made windows for the evening sky, and the rocky ravine with its dusky cedars and shining river was lonelier than before. At the inn I swallowed, or tried to swallow, a glass of horrible wine with my coachman, after which, with my reconstructed team, I drove back to Nîmes in the moonlight. It only added a more solitary whiteness to the constant sheen of the Provençal landscape. End of section 10